Thanks for coming. We're going to go ahead and continue the open session. We will start with call to order and roll call. Councilmember Barnes? Present. Councilmember Matina? Here. Councilmember Parlett? Here. Councilmember Spur? Present. And Mayor Cardone? Here. Thank you. Ron, would you like to lead us in the pledge? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do we have any urgency items? No. Okay. We'll move on then to acceptance of the agenda. Madam Mayor, I'll make a motion to accept the agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Right. Agenda is accepted. Our next item is the consent agenda. <coughs> These items are expected to be routine and non-controversial, and we can act on them all at one time. Um, however, today we did have a notification that the minutes had a correction to them. So I'll go through and read the titles. And then we will move on to either setting the or removing the minutes from approval um, or however the council wants to move on that. So tonight we have we have before us reading except or waive reading except by title of any ordinances under consideration at this meeting. We have approved the minutes of the city council regular meeting of April 3rd, 2018. Approved the Lakeport Criterion event application and agreement between the city of Lakeport and Main Street Elite Cycling. Approve application 2018-14 with staff recommendations for the 2018 Memorial Day Parade to be held May 26, 2018. Approve application 2018-15 with staff recommendations for the 2018 Tuesday Farmers Market to be held from May 1st through September 25th, 2018. Authorize the out-of-state travel as requested by the city manager to attend recon the Global Retail Real Estate Convention in Las Vegas, Nevada, May 20th through 23rd, 2018. And approve the contract for the 2018 Fourth of July fireworks production with Pyro Spectaculars North Incorporated in the amount of $20,500 and authorize the city manager to execute the contract. Let's go ahead. Um, do we need a motion to remove those minutes? No, no, you can just pull back. Then we're going to go ahead and pull the minutes. Uh, do I have a motion, or would the council like to address any of these other agenda items? Is there any member of the public who would care to address any of the items on our consent agenda tonight? Okay. Madam Mayor, if there's nothing further, I'd move for approval of the consent agenda. Minus the minutes. Minus the minutes. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Those are accepted. Can we go ahead and take up the minutes now? Yes. Great. Um, who would like to address the correction that's going to be made? I, I can just state that the um, that there's a correction to uh, who made the motions and seconds on the uh, email policy on those minutes. We did send out a correction to the council and to everyone on our email distribution list. So. Great. Item 8 be on, on, the, on the minutes. On the minutes, I Does council have any discussion on this item? No. Any member of the public care to discuss our typo? Seeing <laughs> <laughs> none, to bring it back to the council then. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of April the 3rd. And As amended. amended. Great. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We'll move on to citizens' input, where any person may speak for three minutes on an issue which is within the council's jurisdiction but is not already on tonight's agenda. Do we have any requests for citizens' input? Thank you. Ken Wicks, would you like to approach? Ken Wicks is speaking on Lake County Sheriff's Activities, Junior Giants. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council, everybody. Tonight I return for our annual uh, 
introduction to the Junior Giants. The Lake County Sheriff's Activities League is offering free baseball and this year's softball to all children 5 to 18. Um, we have multiple leagues. It starts on June 12th. And so our online registration is now available at gojuniorgiants.org, which is gojrgiants.org. Or you can go to our Lake County website, which is lakecountysal.com, um, which is all lowercase. And you can see all of the activities that we do from kayaking to boxing to baseball, and you can sign up there. We're looking for volunteers, coaches, and role models. So this is a new year. It's an expanded program. We're all excited. And so that everybody knows in the community, the Junior Giants in Lake County placed one of 13 of <coughs> 220 leagues in the highest possible rating that the Giants offer out of six different divisions. So we're considered a diamond league, and the kids and the volunteers all made it happen, and so we encourage everybody to come out and have some fun this summer. So, awesome. Thank you. Very can, cool. can, one, can one question? Yes. Um, I was just at uh, Main Street Association, and Melissa from the Chamber was there, and she's looking for things to put in their calendar for kids to do in the summertime. Awesome. So could you get a hold of her and see if I that will. would help her? Absolutely. Tomorrow I'll get a hold of her. I'll go up there and, and make contact with her and give her our schedule and all our stuff. Uh, we also have a calendar on our website that has all that stuff. That, that's a great suggestion. Okay. We're trying to get out the word so that everybody can participate this year. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just to repeat those websites, it's gojuniorgiants.org or Lake County Sal, that's spelled S-A-L for Sheriff's Activity League, dot com. Both really excellent ways to outreach to our youth. Thank you, Ken. It's like a commercial. I <laughs> wanted to make sure we got it in the public. Everybody is watching. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Good. <laughs> if it was my kids, I'd definitely <laughs> sign them up. It would take me this long just to find a pen. Yeah. <laughs> then, you know, so repeat is not a bad thing. Moving on, we have a proclamation tonight. Presentation designating the week of April 15th through 21st as Volunteer Week in the City of Lakeport. I know I can see some super special volunteers out there. I'd really like it if you'd come join me. of the City Council of the City of Lakeport, designating the week of April 15th through 21st, 2018 as Volunteer Week. Whereas the entire community can inspire, equip, and mobilize people to take action that changes the world. And whereas individuals and communities are at the center of social change, discovering their power to make a difference. And whereas during this week, all over the nation, service projects will be performed and volunteers recognized for their commitment to service. And whereas the giving of oneself in service to another empowers the giver and the recipient. And whereas experience teaches us that government by itself cannot solve all of our nation's social problems. And whereas volunteers have greatly enhanced the quality of life in the city of Lakeport. And whereas the Lakeport Police Department has long utilized community members to assist them in their mission. And whereas in 2017, Volunteers in the Lakeport Police Department logged 800 hours of service to their community. And whereas these volunteers have generously given of their time and expertise, now therefore be it proclaimed that the Lakeport City Council does hereby proclaim April 15th through 21st, 2018 as Volunteer Week in the City of Lakeport and calls upon the citizens of Lakeport to volunteer in their respective communities. By volunteering and recognizing those who serve, we can come together to make a difference. Thank you so much. Madam Mayor, maybe we can have uh, the chief introduce who our volunteers are. That would be tonight. awesome. Um, John Wiskirchen, starting here. Um, He's been a volunteer with us for a few years. He's also a volunteer with the uh, CHP on their volunteer crew. And uh, then we have Greg Scott. He's been, I don't know how many years, quite a few eight now. Years. Eight, eight years working for us. 
and uh, Arlen Souza, uh, seven years now, and Jean Patty, six, six years. So um, they do a tremendous amount of work for us. Um, a lot of stuff that we don't have to tie up uh, police officers doing that they're able to do, which is a tremendous asset for the city and um, saves, uh, saves us a lot of money too. Um, but more importantly, um, the community service they're putting out is, is incredible. So I'd like to thank and appreciate them. And if I get a picture of you guys with the mayor, if you don't mind. Well, I'd just like to add that uh, we're lucky to have a, a good police chief with a good fire department, I was a police department. I'm going back to my work years. And they make us feel like we're part of them, part of the team. They care about us. And it's a pleasure to be part of the uh, Lakeport City and Pips Church. to our public hearing. Today's public hearing is to authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute an energy services contract with NG, NG services subject to legal review for the performance of energy upgrades outlined in the presented scope of work. Kevin? Kevin? Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I'll keep my comments real short this evening. Uh, Ashu Jain and uh, has brought also with him uh, uh, his project team from NG. Uh, and he's got a presentation for us this evening. Uh, but before I turn it over to him, I just want to give kind of a, a brief update on where we are since the last time that Ashu was here and presented to the city. Um, NG has had a, a name change. They first came to us as Optera, and they've now changed their name to NG. So that's why you see that. But it is the same firm. And, um, but more importantly, they've completed um, an investment grade audit. Um, they've also completed some project engineering and design and uh, competitively bid out all the different parts of this project uh, to put together uh, what, what we've got here from, for them today. In the end, the entire project proposed is approximately four and a half million dollars with an expected savings to the city of nine million over a 25 to 30 year life of the project. And um, in addition uh, to working with NG, staff has also been working very closely with NHA advisors on putting together a complete financing package for this project. Um, and we're aiming at presenting that with, uh, with NHA's help to uh, your council at your regular meeting on May 15th. As stated in the staff report, we have 60 days after entering into the contract to complete work associated with setting up the financing. Um, if within that 60 days it's found that the um, the savings to the city are uh, show a positive cash flow over that 30 to 40, uh, 25 to 30 years, sorry, for life the project, um, then we can go ahead and move forward. If not, we can cancel that contract within the 60 days. That's an important fact. Uh, just to add also, in our preliminary dealings with NHA, uh, their preliminary showings show it to be a, a uh, financially viable project at this time. So with that, I'll, I'll throw it over to Ashi. Thank you, Ms. Ingram. Uh, good evening. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, members of the council, staff, uh, Ashwin Jain with uh, NG Services US. As Mr. Ingram mentioned, uh, uh, we've been owned by the uh, NG Corporation since the last two years, and it just took us a while to get our name changed. So, um, and I'll briefly go through uh, who NG is, but for that, I'd like to introduce the rest of the team. Uh, we have, I uh, have with me, Heather Benner, our lead project manager, John Kaufman, uh, in business development, uh, Wakar Mustafa, our uh, project engineer, and Muhammad Ali, who's also a project engineer. 
And they've been actually walking uh, all the county buildings since 8 a.m. today, so if they look bored, it's not boredom, they're exhausted. So <laughs> they're really excited to be here, even though it doesn't look like it. <laughs> okay. So with that, I'm going to go through the presentation. Please feel free to interrupt me at any time. So briefly, NG is the um, NG is the largest European utility and um, uh, the largest producer of electricity in the world. They have, uh, they have 150,000 employees and uh, you know, around uh, 150 billion in assets. So, and that's important because we guarantee savings for the long term. So it's very important to know that you have a company uh, that's uh, you know that that can. That has the financial wherewithal to um, you know back the guarantee for 20 years, and we have a major operation in the United States too. Uh, this just talks about what we did last year. We did 40 megawatts of uh, solar projects last year. We did uh, 210,000 uh, LED. We installed 210,000 LED fixtures. You've seen this slide before. We have a lot of experience with. Uh, putting similar projects for cities. So um, this is the scope of work. Um, I'm sorry, I can look at it here instead of turning my head. Um, and I'll, I'll just go through, instead of going through each um, in the, this uh, scope of work on slide six, I'll, I'm just going to take you through um, the detailed scope of work for each, uh, each uh, measure. So lighting. Um, and I, I think there's really no surprises here from what we shared with you when, we, uh, when I was last year in, uh, in September of last year. So, so you know, your council approved a uh, program development agreement back in September, and since September we've been working with staff to finalize everything. And, um, so that's uh, uh, so lighting. Uh, we're proposing lighting at these four buildings: the city hall, police department, uh, corporation yard, and the wastewater treatment plant. And once again, um, the benefit of uh, LED lighting is that it's better quality lighting, it saves 50% energy over what you consume right now, and it lasts a long time without any, uh, uh, you know, uh, operation and maintenance of the uh, You know, it lasts 75 to 100,000 hours, which equates to 25 to 30 years. Uh, we're showing that you know, and it'll definitely, your fixtures will look much better. That's an existing fixture. That's what it's going to look like. Uh, so uh, definitely it'll be a better looking uh, fixture too. Uh, same thing on exterior lighting. Um, you know, uh, we're changing all the exterior lighting with uh, these dual motion sensor lighting. So um, they're usually at around 30% output. If somebody walks close to them, they turn over, turn over to 100%. So they have a motion sensor in it. And that's good for safety also. Uh, and it's uh, good for uh, saving energy. In the downtown area, there you have 104 uh, street, li uh, street lights, which are still old high pressure sodium. And we're going to change these to LED fixtures. The LEDs that we use, are what's called warmer LEDs. They're not the uh, 5,000 Kelvin cold temperature, the bright white. These are more yellow, and and a lot of studies have come out uh, against those lights. And the lighting industry did correct all that. And so we're now uh, going with you know really 3,000 temperature, and it's much warmer looking. So it's not the bright white light that uh, people had a, a lot of problems with. Uh, we are proposing to replace the uh, air conditioning systems at, uh, well, there are seven units at the police department, five units at City Hall right here, and one at the Carnegie Library. We're going to replace those with much more efficient units. Uh, we're also at the cooperation yard. We're going to install um, four uh, Mitsubishi splits, which uh, really are um, you might have seen them there, and they look pretty nice. And they're uh, just an indoor unit below the ceiling. Um, so we're going to do that. And of course, um, you know, the benefits are, of course, that you're, you're replacing units, you know, units, air conditioning units tend to break down in peak summer. So this is planned just to replace them versus <coughs> something during an emergency. So it's, um, and 
you know, so we are sourcing the uh, best efficiency that we can. And uh, and you're going to talk about uh, something later. Uh, Variable frequency drive, that's just a device to uh, save energy uh, at the pumps at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and uh, this is purely, it extends the life of the, uh, of the motor as well as, um, you know, switch gear, and it saves a lot of energy. And I think there are incentives available from uh, pg and &E for that. Uh, coming to the main recommendation, the bulk of the project, um, is the solar project, and the biggest one is at the wastewater treatment plant. And uh, we've sized this for all the meters around the waste, there are three meters around the wastewater treatment plant. Um, three or? Uh, there are three. Two meters, okay. Um, and so, based on that, you know, it's 540 kilowatt system that we are proposing. It's a ground mount system. And, um, you know, we'll have to clear those trees from there, but um, uh, it's uh, it's going to avoid pretty much all the electricity consumption on those uh, at the wastewater treatment plant and all those other meters that are there. There are no questions. I'll keep moving forward. This is the corporation yard, and these are canopies. Um, so this is not on the ground. This will be at uh, what height would it be? Fourteen feet. Fourteen feet high. I'm just a good-looking guy here. You guys are all the brains. So I, you know, I have to turn around and ask them. So, uh, so 14 feet height. Uh, that's so that we can park all the heavy equipment underneath. And uh, this also avoids uh, the electricity on two or three uh, meters. That uh, there's actually sewer pump there and uh, water well. I'll stop it. Um, Next slide, we have the uh, ground mount solar project at uh, for one of the wells, the Green Brand Solar Well. And that is the uh, maximum that amount of solar we could do for that well. It completely avoids the electricity uh, consumption there. <coughs> the next one is uh, City Hall. And now I'm going to do my best impression of Vanna White. And is this? Yeah. Okay, so this is what, staff wanted to make, make sure that you have a chance to look at what it could look like. So we did, took some pictures and we do it all the time, we made a rendering. And uh, this is what it's gonna look like. Uh, I don't know if you wanna add something, but I'm gonna actually leave it here. Uh, so. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I think you'll do a better impression than I will. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a reason why you didn't put it on the city hall instead of in the park wall? So there's uh, really three problems in putting solar on existing roofs. One is, you know, the panels weigh around four pounds per square feet, and so the roof's really not designed for that. It might be okay, but it's not designed for that. The second problem is penetrations. We're going to penetrate the roof. And a lot of times that leads to a lot of conflict between us and the, uh, and the company who has a volunteer on the roof. Third problem is once we put panels on the roof, it's really difficult to remove it. So we try to avoid uh, putting panels on the roof of existing buildings. New buildings, we do it all the time. And uh, you know, this provides you shade as well as, uh, as, well as the, uh, electricity. So it's also, we thought, a better application. Thank you. Does it show there where you're going to put the electric charging station? Uh, that's a great point. Um, I think you're putting the electric car, uh, it's right next to the, and you got the two the, more Yeah, slides. It, it serves the ADA spot and the one so, right next to it. So, so it serves the ADA spot and the one next to it, and I don't know, is that, that right there or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, the, I believe the ADA spot's this one right here, and so it'll okay. serve these two right here. Okay. So, we are putting in the talk to talk to Thank you. Next is the, the police department. We are proposing a 38 kilowatt parking canopy um, at that location. And uh, this is a parking canopy so you can park in the beach. 
is the electrical charging station just a slide, but it goes back on that uh, what you mentioned. Um, so, oh, I realized when I sent you the presentation, I didn't. You have a slide in there that we added later on. I apologize for that. But you have a slide that says community impact civic spot. Yes. Uh, so this is something that's a program that, uh, let me give you some background on this. Uh, we were part of Chevron for 15 years before, uh, before NG brought us. And then Chevron, Chevron had a lot of public programs that they wanted us to include, which they were, Chevron was funding. Uh, we, used, we do a lot with students, we do a lot with school districts, and these programs that we fund, funded when we were part of Chevron. But NG bought us, they looked at those programs, and they said, we would like to continue that, that's a good thing. So we, we have these programs, that, you know, the community impact programs, NG Corporation pays for it, it doesn't come out of the project, the city is not paying for it. So this is actually relatively new for us, but uh, there's this uh, initiative called uh, Civic Spark. It's part of the AmeriCorps program. AmeriCorps is similar to the Peace Corps, except it's for uh, within the country, not, not, not abroad. And what AmeriCorps does, they hire these graduates uh, who are interested in sustainability, and they place them for 11 months at a city, uh, or, or it could be any. Uh, it, actually, there are two civic sport fellows at a local water district. Hidden Valley. Like Hidden Valley uh, Water District. So they are actually there already. Mm -hmm. um, I talked to the staff member there and said, her, she called them Sparkies. She said, her Sparkies are doing really well. <laughs> so, so it's a great program, and it comes to you at no cost. And um, what they will basically do uh, get involved. What we talked to Mr. Ingram is that they will work on the water site and uh, collect data. Uh, they can be ambassadors for this project. They'll reach out to the community. I mean, <coughs> basically, you have to define, um, or staff has to define what they would like these fellows to do. Well, it's one uh, here, one fellow. And uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, they, it's somebody that will be available to you for 11 months. And they'll gain valuable experience working in the city, and you know, uh, you will have uh, a, a, a graduate, uh, uh, you know, uh, undergrad uh, somebody who's completed his undergraduate in sustainability, um, and you can, you know, use them um, as best as you think you can. So that's a good program, and it's, uh, you know, it's something that uh, we, would, we would love to fund, and uh, um, you know, we're trying to do more and more of this with other uh, cities and counties. If there are no questions, I'm going to run a uh, little financial analysis. And so, what, like Mr. Ingram mentioned, this is a $4.5 million project, um, and there are certain assumptions uh, that we've made. Uh, which are exactly the same as when we presented the feasibility study, 5% uh, escalation of electricity cost, 3% escalation of o and cost. In the first year, we're saving 267000 There are some minor operation and maintenance savings, which are savings because we are replacing your air conditioning, your lamps and ballast, you don't need to replace them. So we've uh, worked with staff and come up with that amount. There's minor incentives for lighting mostly, so the total program savings in the first year is 280. We will completely maintain the solar project. Your staff does not have to do anything. We'll clean the panels. We'll, uh, you know, uh, anything that's needed on the solar panels is on us. So that's the cost of that. Um, and there's some inverter replacement cost. And so the total program cost. Oh yeah, there's no lease payment here. So. Uh, so the total program cost is 14000 which is just the maintenance cost. So the net savings before the lease payment is the column on the right hand. Uh, so those are the savings before making the lease payments. So the lease payment still needs to be decided, 
And uh, what we work with your, uh, your staff and uh, us, we work with your financial advisor, and uh, I have a couple of slides in that. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, um, it's in your slide deck, and I, uh, I will email this, uh, this presentation to, the, uh, to Mr. Indian after I'm done. So, project financing, uh, if you can look in your um, presentations. So there are three enterprise, there are three funds that uh, this project impacts uh, among slide 22. It's the wastewater enterprise fund, the water enterprise fund, and the general fund. Uh, for the enterprise funds, there'll be a revenue pledge. And uh, for the general fund, the collateral will just be the equipment that being installed. So there is no um, you know, revenue pledge, or, uh, building asset uh, transfer, or anything like that. The collateral is the solar panel. Um, so, uh, so that's how uh, staff and the financial advisor have uh, decided to uh, finance this project. Uh, I'll go to the next slide, um, 23. So these are over the 30-year life of the project. Uh, on the wastewater project, um, it will be around 2.75 million that will be financed. That's the financing amount. The savings, the net savings, are in the four and a half to five million dollar range, and the financing period will be around 18 years. And all this still needs to be finalized. So, same for the water project and the general fund project. Water project, we are thinking of financing over 20 years and the general fund project over 25 years. So overall, the savings would be in the seven to eight million dollar range. Uh, and that's still to be determined. And as uh, Mr. Ingram mentioned, if your council decides to approve this project today, um, the contract does say that you have 60 days to finalize the financing. We'll be happy to extend it to 90 days. So that's not an issue. It's, uh, it's, uh, and the contract from entirely uh, you know, we still need to finalize the contract, so um, so we'll allow enough time uh, for NHG advisors to arrange the financing. And uh, if the financing doesn't look attractive to you, uh, the contract will be void. Uh, so there's no cost to the city at that point. I will now go to the next slide, which is the benefit slide. Um, so. You know, this project will save you millions over the project life. Um, and uh, you're going to reduce the electricity spend. Actually, it's more like 70%, not 50%. And um, the more you save, the less you're dependent on PGE. So you're hedging the increases that PGE is, uh, um, you know, uh, putting on every year. Uh, you get Shape of the vehicles, uh, we guarantee 95% of the energy savings for lighting and solar, which are the bulk of the savings here. So 95% so of the savings are guaranteed for 20, uh, for the finance term. Um, uh, actually, no more than 20 years, though. So it will be guaranteed for 20 years. And it's a real guarantee if we produce less uh, solar energy than we have told you, we will actually, there's a rate in the contract and we will write you a check for the difference times the rate in the contract. The difference in kilowatt hours that we have, uh, uh, we fall short by times the kilowatt hours. So, uh, so it's a real guarantee. And we'll do that for 20 years. Um, you're using the savings to replace all your old uh, HVAC equipment. You're not using any funding directly from the general fund. And, um, you know, uh, the other thing I was going to point out earlier is stimulate local economy, provide local jobs. We are actually work very well with local contractors. And uh, for the HVAC, which is a quite a large project, uh, we are working with, uh, we have contacted two local <coughs> HVAC contractors, and uh, only one has decided to give us a price yet. And uh, we're very sure that we'll be contracting with one of them. So that's a large part of the uh, pro project. Um, and um, so we, we do, a, and no, no contract's been decided yet, obviously, because we don't have a you know, contract yet, and we haven't done our engineering. But once we do the engineering, we'll reach out 
Uh, we do a pretty good job of reaching out to the local contractor community, the Chamber of Commerce, and encouraging the local uh, contractors to, uh, to participate in this uh, project. Um, and then, of course, uh, the last bullet there is about uh, substantial environmental benefits. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, 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 it's equivalent to removing 285 cars off the road annually. If your council decides to approve this project tonight and the financing gets approved um, in May, um, we hope to start uh, implementing the project in June, and we think it will take us, or it will take us one year to complete the project in all respects. That's the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions. If you start in June, what would be your first part of the project that you think about doing? So the first part of the project it's engineering, actually. We haven't done final engineering yet, so it'll take us two to three months. We'll have to go through the normal plan check process. We're going to submit, you know, come up with engineering drawings. We'll submit it to the, uh, to the city for a plan check. At the same time, we'll be ordering material. And uh, you'll see activity, I would think, after three months. Uh, and we'll, uh, one of the first things we'll do is lighting. That's very simple. It's really not a big scope. And we do lighting at night. Um, so we'll do the lighting. Um, you know, towards the end of the year, we're going to do air conditioning, so it's you know, so it doesn't impact um, the occupant so much. And um, I think, yeah, somewhere in the September, October, November time frame, we'll start with the solar project. Okay. And then you were speaking about the lighting and going, not using the. 5,000 Kelvin, but yes. 3,000. Is that what the AMA's uh, recommends? The AMA's, uh, the AMA report was about 5,000. So the lighting industry has really reacted very positively to that and lowered the uh, lighting level because of the AMA article. So it's gone down to 3,000 because right. of the AMA. Yes. Okay, that's it. And then the last question I have is how long does the typical solar panel last? Yes, sir. I see that you have a cost in here for uh, an inverter. Right. So the solar panels problems. are guaranteed for 25 years, okay. and uh, um, typical life is considered 30 years, but they are guaranteed to produce no less than 80% of their output in year 25. We uh, There are panels that are still, so Sacramento Municipal Utility District, SMUD, installed these same technology back in the 60s, and they actually took it down two years ago because they needed that location. So they were working fine. So this technology's been around for a long time, and you know, we've been doing these projects for solar projects now since 2003, so it's been 15 years for us. And uh, you know, we're very confident they last at least 30 years. Any other questions from Council? I, I have a quick question. I just wanted to make sure I understood. Are we talking about uh, a purchase and financing the equipment, or yes, you will own not a lease? It, it is a lease, but it will you own the equipment from day one, and uh, you call it an install. Uh, install yeah, why equipment. is it called a lease payment? It's very confusing. Yeah. Uh, it is. It's uh, like making a payment on yeah, it. Yeah, it's an installment loan. Uh, uh, you know, so you own the equipment from day one. The bank would have a security interest. Okay. And they'll lose this. Uh, you know, I heard the, you say both, and then lease right. payment. Uh, it is wait, something that clarify. I come across all the time. The general term in the industry is yeah. lease. Um, but it is. Yeah, I totally understand. You own it. From okay. Day one. That's it. So you said that the, the panels were installed in Sacramento in the 60s. If that was like 1969, so that would be like 37 years, and they were still functioning at 80, functioning. 85 percent. And they I don't know what level. But I, I don't know what level they were functioning. But they were still functioning. Yeah, they were still so they could have been at 10 percent. <laughs> could have been. I mean, I'm sure there's data available because the, the purpose was to track them, and uh, um, but they are guaranteed. For 20 uh, to be no less than 80 percent in 25 years, and by then the, the savings will be seven, eight million dollars. Yes, and I'll be long gone. Yeah, <laughs> it won't be a problem. <laughs> Any further questions? I had a couple. Yes, uh, and maybe this is a, a Kevin question, but going back to the wastewater treatment plant for the ground mount solar photovoltaic system, was it is our only option to remove all those trees? There's nowhere else we could have scooched it to. I don't think those are tall trees. I think uh, do you remember what you call them? Stuff? Yeah, there are a few trees over there, and that's the only option because we discussed the public works, and that's the place they were. They want Mr. Bird might be willing to. 
Wait a minute. So. Yeah, there. Well, I can talk loud enough. There's no heritage jokes or in, any type of tree like that. These are basically what you know, a scrub pine. Oh, okay. And so we were we looked very closely at that, particularly for the heritage oak, and there will be none disturbed. Thank you. You're welcome. My second one. I think the first time you came before us, we had a brief discussion about dark skies and how our, right. our anticipated outdoor lighting okay. wouldn't affect our dark skies. We could still preserve that. I just wanted to confirm that. Absolutely right. LED lighting is very directional, and so it is the best lighting that you can install for dark skies. Thank you. And then lastly, um, on the inside lighting, the LED lighting, um, uh, we have staff that have that, that connect getting migraines to a blue undertone um, electric light. Is this similar to that, or is this does this take that into consideration? Like I, when it says bright lighting, sometimes I've seen in our office in the county they replace it with this big bright blue lighting, which is harsh. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I don't know what I don't think LED lighting that looks like. high color temperature, which makes it harsh. Okay. And uh, we do a um, tremendous amount of LED lighting. Just last year, like I said, we installed 200,000 fixtures uh, in, uh, in, the, in the country. And, uh, we, and we've been doing LED lighting for, I must say, seven, eight years now. And we've had no complaints at all about that. Uh, and if, um, you know, if there's a person who complains, uh, we're willing to, you know, we'll, we'll change the lighting. Uh, we'll, we'll, come up with another solution or go back to uh, close and lighting in that I would focus. just hate to be saving all this electricity and have no staff able to come to work. <laughs> no, it's... Is that, is that what happened? Well, well, is is there, yeah, it, there's a pretty clear connection between the, the internal fluorescent lighting yeah. and migraines. Oh. This won't be fluorescent. This is not fluorescent. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, That's what I'm looking for. So yeah. fluorescent yeah. does have a frequency yeah, that something. goes on and off. So these lights turn on and off 50, yeah. okay. 50 times in a uh, second. Awesome. But the, the LEDs with the blue lighting, and that's the higher spectrum, like the 5,000s, instead okay. of the 3,000 or even less, because I've seen where they wanted you to get 2,700 uh, Kelvin. So the lower the Kelvin, the less the brightness. Awesome. Yeah, I'm no expert on lighting. I just know complaints when I hear them. Yeah. yeah. And that would be a question I would have is, is there a way to, to uh, before we start installing the LEDs, that we could have, like, Different, have a, like a little demonstration of what do a different Kelvins look like, and pick one before you start putting them in. Sure, we can do a mock-up uh, of. Uh, we'll, we'll use the city manager's office. See if it works <laughs> <in the end. laughs> well, well, it, them. <laughs> it, it occurs to me that after two hundred thousand installations in the last year, and you've been doing it for six or seven years. I don't think that this is something that hasn't come up before, and they probably asked for that, but I'm sure that if there were any issues, they would have been discovered long before now. Yes. Which is well, what I'm hopeful for. However, if I were getting migraines from lighting, I don't think I would call NG. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. but, but I but appreciate someone would. taking that but into someone consideration. Would. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that the, um, the new installation, I have about, I don't know, probably, 100 fluorescent lights in and around my building and I've been doing the transition to the LEDs which the hookup is easier you don't have the ballast you don't have all the you know the PCBs and the old ballast which are still up there because they did the retrofits and um, the they're amazing and the lighting is tremendous and it's just knowing that you only have to deal with them once is great I just put in 20 new fluorescents on one side of the building on the west side the other day because I didn't have they haven't got the eight footers yet that I can get uh, economically so, so yeah. I just put the lower wattage different ballast and it's just an ongoing nightmare and then all the ballasts are made in China and they last for like a couple months whereas the old ones probably still have in the corporate yard that are 50 years old and they're still working but the new stuff is just such junk where these don't even have ballast so it's, right. it's a huge savings on maintenance not, not to mention going up on the ladder and paying people to go do that. So this is, once you put them up, you're done. So it's really cool. Yeah. And then one last question. Uh, the ones that are going to be the, on the ground, the solars that are going to be on the ground, uh, we know that the, the, the yard is going to be 14 feet. How high are the ones on? Yeah, roughly two feet. The lower edge will be around two feet off the ground. Two feet? Yeah. 
because my concern would be this one that she was talking about with the trees is real close to our road and people might throw things at them. Like, well, we are going to fence it. Okay. Yeah. No, that is a concern. At the school, they got rid of every boulder, every pebble, every stone yeah, I mean, anywhere near the solar panel. What about softball? No, it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. And and it's going to be the back, They still so. have had some vandals. How, how sturdy are they for a rock being thrown at one? Uh, it will yeah. 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 Softball won't, uh, baseball can't. Yeah. Yeah. The school has, you know, this size cobblestones. No, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so if council is ready, we'll, we'd like to open it up to the public for input, please. David, if you could state your name for the record, that'd be great. Uh, my name is David Velasquez. I'm a resident of Lakeport, and uh, I am doing my action to change the world today as a volunteer. Um, I'm a member of the Friends of Taylor Observatory uh, in Kelseyville, and as part of that, uh, our mission is to promote astronomy and STEM in Lake County. But one of the things that we're also doing is we're also looking at developing a, um, a dark sky designation for Lake County. And so I was a little, well, I wanted to make sure that what we were hearing today uh, was hopefully going to be in line with what the International Dark Sky Association recommends for outdoor lighting. I can't address the indoor lighting, but it uh, sounds like some of the people on the council are familiar with uh, color temperatures and so on, the amber, the blues, uh, the issues going on. Uh, because LED lighting tends to be um, accepted as just, the, the new wave of things, but there's a lot of detail in the way the LEDs are set up. So um, what I would like to do is just make sure, and I was really glad to hear uh, the types of color temperatures that they were going to be addressing on the outdoor lighting. Um, we are working with uh, the county, hopefully, and with the city of Lakeport, and with the city of Clear Lake eventually, to try and implement the regulations or recommendations from the International Dark Sky Association so that we can have dark skies in Lake County to promote astrotourism, uh, just to make the county a more desirable place for people to come and uh, spend their dollars. So uh, I've worked with Kevin, we've met Kevin, we've met with uh, Will DeShock in, uh, in LEDAC. Uh, there's been a presentation to the city of Lakeport and this just seemed like a good opportunity to make sure that things that are being implemented in the city of Lakeport follow along the guidelines. Uh, I'm just going to briefly mention uh, five bullet points, six bullet points that the International Dark Sky uh, recommends for outdoor lighting fixtures. One, always choose fully shielded fixtures that emit no light upward. And, and I'd appreciate the comments on these when I'm done. Uh, second is use warm white or filtered LEDs with the CCT, which is correlated color temperature of less than 3,000 K and about 2,700 K is that amber color that the uh, low pressure um, sodium used to use that uh, was being adopted before LEDs became very popular. With an S to P ratio of 1.2, the higher the S to P ratio, the bluer the light. So you want something low to get away from that white and blue color uh, to minimize the blue. Look for products with adaptive controls like dimmers, timers, and motion sensors. And I was glad to see that's being incorporated as well. Uh, dimming or turning off the lights during overnight hours. Avoid the temptation to overlight because um, of the increased luminosity of LEDs. And um, only need to uh, um, illuminate the spaces for security and safety reasons. So those are the, those are very simple, the, simply the, ex, um, the um, recommendations for the IDA. I do have these that eventually we're probably going to get to the council anyway. And I also have a more uh, detailed recommendation from the International Dark Sky Association on LED lighting, which um, I'm happy to share, and I'm happy to work with Kevin if, if we can provide any information from the International Dark Sky Association for this particular um, application. And that's it. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that the council might have. So it's 3,000. Uh, good because it's between 3,000 and 2,700? Uh, 3,000 is, is good. 27 to 3,000 is really the recommended because of the, uh, the amber color. 
David, I'm so glad you came. When I was reading about the different lighting, I thought if only David would come to the meeting, he would probably know about this. And one of the um, main reasons that we moved, my husband wanted to move back home to Lake County was because you could actually see the stars there. Yes. So I'm hoping that doesn't change. And in fact, we are doing a Road Scholars presentation at uh, Talman. We did one last year, and we get people that come from all over the country, and they are really excited to see the skies that we have here. So I think it really, it sounds a little bit like it, it's far out, um, because there are dark skies in other parts of the country, of course, but to have the lake here, to have the, the op opportunity for tourism, and have this on top of it, it's really nice to try and maintain that as much as we possibly can. So uh, Bernie Butcher at Tallman is recognizing that, um, and uh, we're, we're getting more and more people uh, from the Bay Area that really are appreciating what we have here. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we install, I think, um, we're probably one of the largest installers of street lights in the state. Uh, we did all of San Jose, that was like 60,000 street lights. We did Salinas, we did uh, um, Fremont. Uh, so we, we, we installed a lot of street lights. And we, were, we have a lighting group, in a, I'm not a lighting expert, but we have um, you know five people in California. We have a lighting division, uh, and they have a lot of expertise in lighting. So. Uh, whatever the gentleman said, we're, we're very comfortable with it. We'll, you know, I already have emails from the lighting group saying it will be less than 3,000 or 3,000 or less is what they have said. Um, they also said, and I'm going to read it, um, it said the issue related to sky glow is largely eliminated by using quality LED fixtures in any color because it's an optically superior technology that directs the light to the ground rather, rather than in, into the sky. And if that means we have to put some kind of a uh, what's the word? Shield. 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 Uh, we'll definitely do that. So we fully want to, you know, um, work with the city and make sure everybody is happy with what we provide. And um, I don't see any issue here. Hey, Michael Green. Quick question. Project looks great, um, and I don't probably it wasn't in the scope of work. Uh, I'm looking at all those kilowatts of solar panels. I'm thinking of uh, emergencies, for example, uh, during the flood or PG&E goes down and all that. So my familiarity with solar is mainly like off the grid systems. There's generally some battery backup. So um, I don't know enough about what the backup systems are already in place for the city. Uh, but if you've got solar at the police department and there's a backup and they lose power, I wonder if there's an opportunity there that was looked at to give them a backup source of power that, that they don't have currently. Um, the same thing with utilities, or maybe a way, uh, you got a lot of wattage out there, is there any battery backup that could help them in a time of, of, uh, of emergency? So what, this question, what is our existing capacity for uh, backup power at the various city locations that would be important? And then two, uh, I, it was probably outside of the scope of work, but is there something we could do to at least ask the question, is there something we can do to leverage all this good solar uh, uh, mojo and uh, hopefully en enhance our uh, emergency power supplies at the same time? So it's more of a question. Thank you. Um, so solar panels are not good for backup. Um, you know, as you can imagine, uh, cloud cover can uh, reduce the consumption quite a bit, or the production. And uh, the solar panels are, you know, the way that, I think for your emergency, like the police department uh, or any other, you know, 911, you have diesel genset as backups so or something like that. And that's the, really the only way to back up right now. We are, uh, we own the largest energy storage company in the country. It's a company called Energy Storage. Um, and we looked at storage at every one of your facilities, and it just doesn't cancel. Um, so, uh, so it's, uh, you know, there is incentive available from PG&E for energy storage, but the financial payback wasn't there. Um, so we did not include it. Even batteries are not really good meant for uh, backup right now. That, you know, maybe five years down the road, 
the technology will become less expensive and you can do that. But right now, you know, your, your diesel gensets uh, are the best way to back up your systems. Well, I can say that um, those uh, battery backup things for the computers, um, I thought they would be a great thing in case the power went out. I could hook up my cash registers to them or something like that. And they last for about, uh, you know, four or five minutes. They're absolutely a joke. And, uh, yeah, I, I concur totally that battery backups are, you know, if there's any drain at all, I mean, sure, you can, like, keep your light on in the corner and maybe eat a cheese sandwich until it goes dark. But it isn't going to provide, you know, any cooking or anything like that. Yeah, and as to the question of what we have now, we all have generators, City Hall, PD, and Public Works has for generators, too. And generators for... Well, for pumps and for the fashion house, for new stuff. Anything else you want to add to that, Doug? Uh, yeah. yeah. All of our critical infrastructure has generator, diesel generator backups currently. And so, um, so from that aspect, we're, we're covered right now. And if the technology ever comes to where batteries quit being so problematic, mainly in disposal and the hazardous, environmental concerns with batteries and battery acids. Uh, I think that can always be looked at at that time when the technology catches up with, uh, with what the needs are. So how, how much are we talking before we're in an emergency? Is this like a rainy week? Is it? Well, anytime our power goes out, it, like it's all <coughs> automatic that goes on and, and PD, they or any, any power short just like that, they automatically come on. Well, is this is this going to be like backed up by pg e itself? I mean, the thing is, is like if you get it in your house and you have solar panels, uh, you produce enough energy and you put it back into pg and &E, uh, and, you know, you get paid for it. But if your solar panels go dead, then pg and &E's still hooked up to your house, so is that going to be sort of how this is going to work? I, yeah, I believe so, but I'll let you uh, Yes, yeah, no, uh, so, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, any power that you don't use is automatically being sold to pg &E at every 15 minute interval. And if, um, you know, your solar panels are not producing as in the night, you're fully connected to pg &E, you're always connected to pg &E. And if pg &E goes down, the solar projects have to go down. I mean, uh, that's a uh, safety requirement. Okay, so what you're saying is that uh, we have solar panels and we have a power outage from PG&E, then our panels will still work in, in our building, but we cannot work in the building at all. They will not work at all. Okay, but we're covered on rainy weeks. Right. And right, in case of PG&E going down, it's the same as we are now. Exactly. Right. That doesn't change. I can only imagine what it would be like in places like Eureka, where it seems like the sun never shines. Would this even be feasible? <laughs> yeah, I don't recall you said that, putting Eureka in one of your project uh, packages. No. no. Yes. Any other members of the public who would like to address this issue, please? All right. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council. You want to close the public hearing? Oh, I'm sorry. We'll close the public hearing. Thank you. Did you hit that? No, I hate wagons. It's so bad. Yeah. <laughs> now it's clear. Now we're clear. It's So is there any going to be any discussion or we're all good on with it? Everybody's all good? It says, uh, Madam Mayor, I move to offer a city manager to negotiate and execute an energy services contract with NG Services, subject to legal review for the performance of energy upgrades outlined in the percent and scope of work. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. I'm going to leave this here. Sure. Thank you. Great. Thank All right. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Going to move on to the next item of our agenda. Okay. Council business. 
authorize the city manager to sign an associated purchase order and purchase agreement for the landscape structures play booster number 107686-2-2 from Ross Recreation Equipment Company Incorporated. Yes. Uh, Madam Mayor, honorable council members, before you, um, you have a staff report that outlines the steps uh, that uh, we went through in uh, vetting this playground structure, uh, which I'm going to uh, briefly go over. Uh, this uh, comes from the Park and Rec Commission uh, when it was determined that a new playground structure was necessary for the larger kids or the bigger structure in Library Park. Uh, we took that to the um, Park and Rec Commission. Uh, discussed it with them. Um, they were in concurrence that uh, we were in need of a new structure there. Uh, the main reason for that is is that the, the structure that we have now is made out of the old original trucks type material. And what we found is over the years, unfortunately, uh, it warps and it twists and it starts coming apart and uh, it's starting to get hard to hold it together. Uh, the other issue is, is the company that made that structure is no longer in business. And in the playground business, you won't find one playground company that is going to sell you parts to put on someone else's play structure because of a liability issue. So now we're down to not being able to get replacement parts for the current one that we have. So in looking at new play structures, we made sure that the materials and the the, the playground manufacturers had long histories uh, being very reputable in replacement parts and in the materials that they use uh, in their play structures. Uh, we went out and um, solicited. We've got three responses back. Um, those were, um, all came together and gave presentations for uh, their play structure. Uh, we went over that with the Park Direct Commission and Park and Rec Commission settled on the, um, uh, the system that's before you tonight. They did have some recommendations, requests that additional things be added to that play structure. Uh, we went back to the manufacturer and those items were added and are included in um, the diagrams that you have before you now. Uh, one nice thing about this particular company, the supplier is as local as you can get for play structures. They're out of Santa Rosa. Um, they've been there for many, many years. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how many, but I know over 25. Uh, we do get some of our run-of-the-mill things from, uh, from Ross. Uh, we get our swing chains and the buckles and those kinds of things from them. They've been very responsive. Anytime we place an order with them, um, we get it really promptly, which is really a big deal with play structures, is not only the availability, but how long it takes you to get to it. Because in the summertime, if you have to shut down a play structure in Library Park, that is a big deal. And so having the reliability and the dependability of a good play structure is, is really crucial. And so we really kind of went through all of that in the staff report, so instead of droning on here, I think it would be better if council has any questions, I could answer those. And I have Ron Ladd here also, who is our certified playground instructor, if you should happen to have very technical questions. Playground instructor? Ron should come up, because you put a lot of time and effort in this. I'm sure there's something you're dying to tell us. Ron? <laughs> you sure there's something I want to tell you? <laughs> so I think Doug, I'm not sure how to address. I haven't done this before, so thank you for having me here, Council and the Mayor. And I appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation. Um, we did work really hard on this and get a lot of a lot of ideas, and we ran it all through the Park and Rec Committee. And then they had a lot of ideas, so it's been a long process um, to get what we have right now before you. So I appreciate the time and, and looking at it. So the, uh, Doug really covered everything that, that I would say about it. Um, this upgrade would also 
give us an opportunity to improve uh, accessibility routes to it um, as the codes have changed over the years with the accessibility routes. That would give us a great chance to, to catch up a little bit there. And yeah, I think he. So I'm looking at that picture of it. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Are those, is that a little wall of fish? It is. That was part of the thing we went around and around on the colors with, and it, it kind of it kind of it's went awesome. uh, to this more of a nature theme. Okay, that was my next question. Is it really green, or is it going to be blue, or? This is the color. This is it. That okay. we settled on. They were very specific with the lime green accents and the and the composite log climbers and <laughs> the fish panel, and so. Yeah, and it's not easy to ask a manufacturer to change anything in a, <laughs> in a playground structure because of the tolerances and the use zones. It's, it's everything is to the millimeter, literally. And so if you go, you know, I kind of like that fish panel on this overhead ladder, but I don't like this other thing. It's not just as easy as taking them apart and snapping something else in there because we have a very specific play area over there in that sunken area and so we don't have room to expand and contract so um, there's very strict use zone rules that we have to to follow so the manufacturer really worked with us he brought out like that crime 360 thing that they've used that law enforcement uses because the the tolerances have to be so specific and so that he was sure what he was presenting would fit within the standards. <coughs> well, you know, the, the, I, I actually remember, I don't know, it was 15, 20 years ago, time flies, but I remember there was a number of uh, accidents in different places and somebody broke their arm and someone fell off the monkey bars. And, and I really believe that with the litigious society that we were in and with the McDonald's coffee cup and then with the jurors that are just giving away money helter-skelter, and um, I really believe that, that there was going to be no more playgrounds. And so I can totally understand that the rules and regulations are probably very, very stiff to keep culpability down to a minimum, which I'm sure they still exist, and the special bark that floated away during the flood. It's just unbelievable that any of us lived through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s at all. So we appreciate your hard work. Engineered wood fiber. I, I'm gonna brag, <laughs> I want to brag on Ron real quick here. We're really fortunate to have Ron in our staff. He's amazing. Ron, to do the inspection testing, it was like 70% failure on that testing. It's a very, it sounds, it's very, very difficult See testing. Why. And uh, Ron did on his first try, and he's, he's, he's just an amazing so awesome. employee, so we appreciate him so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And this looks awesome. I do have one concern, but yes. uh, in one of the slides you have here, you have this little boy walking on this pipe. <laughs> Okay, it's just like that far off the ground, and there's a pipe that wants to be walking. Those are around. awesome. I love yeah, doing but them. That to me, that's like easy to trip over, and I'm just wondering if it's <laughs> something that we really should have in our playground. Can't take it out unless you're Yeah. I just wanted that question never came up. Yeah. And the engineering's well, done, so. That question comes up, and actually, I mean, it is healthy to have low risk features in your park because it's part of how a child develops to learn to take certain risk and it's it's all considered in there um, that this is a five to twelve year old playground you know it's recommended for that age group and that that's an acceptable obstacle for them to help build their risk-taking um, abilities and, and things like that and so, balance and it, so you stay out <laughs> I won't be able to do it, so I'm not going to do it. considered. We can meet down there and do a balance beam seminar. It's 5 to 12. That's just a recommendation. Yeah. There, there is also a shift within uh, the playground industry and, and the governmental agencies that are overseeing it um, actually to lighten up on some of their risk assessments exactly for what Ron said. What they're finding is 
is without kids being able to be exposed to cause and effect, um, this, it's all part of their developmental learning and risk. And so if you make the playground so safe that they possibly can't get hurt, they're finding now that these, ch these children have a mentality that they can do anything and not be injured. And so now actually, believe it or not, there is a swing in the, you know, the regulator, regulatory agencies to start allowing more risk back into the playground because they feel it's healthier for the children. That makes sense. My kids both fell off the top. <laughs> I think it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Great work. Take the signature picture. Can I take a sign sheet? <laughs> All right. Council is ready to take some public input. Are you? Anyone? Ready to join us on our playground discussion? Right. We have a kid. <laughs> Come away. <laughs> no All right. So we'll bring it back to council for discussion and motion. <laughs> If there's no further discussion, I'll make a motion to authorize the city manager to sign the associated purchase order and purchase agreement for the landscape structures play booster number 107686-2-2 from Ross Recreation Equipment Company, Inc. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion carries. Thanks. Just get this Next item. Adopt the proposed resolution approving the City of Lakeport SB1 project list for the fiscal year 2018 and 19 and direct staff to submit to the California Transportation Commission. Uh, Madam Mayor, Honorable Council, uh, before you have a request from staff uh, to authorize our SB1 projects, um, this is a requirement for the SB1 funds that the Council has to pass a resolution. Um, before the funding date. Uh, if you'll notice what we're requesting funding for is for um, continuation of trying to bring our downtown um, all together and complete the projects. Uh, the project we're looking at is probably going to be a two-phase project on 2nd Street um, between Main Street and Park Street. In other words, the piece in front of City Hall. Um, the first phase is going to be new sidewalks, curbs, and gutters, and that's what we're looking at for this amount of funding. Um, there is a possibility that for that phase of the project, there might not be, uh, we not, might not expend all of those funds. So there is um, language in the SB1 provisions that allow us to use any leftover for other projects. And so that's why we, if you'll notice underneath that it has various paving projects so we would if there are any funds left over then we would move those into paving projects so um, uh, our goal is to eventually be able to have all of downtown Lakeport between Forbes and Park Street all of our streets with good sidewalk and good pavement and so this is a continuation along those lines. This doesn't impact our major <coughs> projects that we have coming up this year, which are the uh, pavement preservation on South Main Street and 11th Street. Uh, this is separate and apart from that. Any questions from Council? Well, I, I noticed that I was looking at your proposed list that it has a pre-construction on 7-1-2018 what exactly do you mean by pre-construction? We have to do plans and get all the plans drawn up. We've started trying to work on that now with very limited staff. But we have to get all the elevations because if you notice, some places we have a 12-inch curb out here and some places we have a 3-inch curb. So the idea is to bring that street back into a conformity. So in order to do that, we have engineering that has to be done to determine the grades and then it has to all be made ADA compliant and that's all done pre-construction that all has to you know you have to have all that figured out before you start pouring concrete so we'll get that all designed ready to go and then we'll do the project and so the project according to this the construction would start like in August basically maybe that's that is our hope yes <coughs> okay. 
I was just concerned with Fourth of July. <coughs> don't really want the streets torn up and stuff. For what, what I am I very cognizant of the Fourth of July. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Madam Mayor, if there's nothing further, I move to adopt the proposed resolution approving the City of Lakeport SB1 project list for fiscal year 2018-19 and direct staff to submit to the California Transportation Commission. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion carries. Our next item is to adopt a resolution accepting the hotel feasibility <laughs> study prepared for the City of Lakeport by HVS. Kevin? Yes. Uh, Good evening again, council members. Uh, this is an exciting one to present to you. Um, we completed our hotel feasibility study uh, with the help of HBS um, it, a little earlier this year. Um, if you recall, um, in 2017, the city was successful in obtaining a $40,000 grant uh, from USDA through their Rural Business Development uh, Grant Program for the purposes of completing the hotel feasibility study and then also for marketing um, marketing the results of that study. Um, in completing the study, the city um, hired HVS, who's very well known in the, um, in the industry uh, for um, com completing these projects for and, and then also attracting um, appropriate, um, appropriate hotel providers uh, based on their studies as well. Uh, there was a lot of, I would call it sort of tough love involved in the process. Um, one of the uh, disadvantages we found that Lakeport has and, and the Lake County region as a whole is uh, sort of the lack of some of these um, sort of good foundational data sources. Um, so, you know, the, uh, you, the hotel providers like some hard quantitative data in their reports as they're looking at it. And, uh, you know, it's easy when you come out here and take a look at the site that, you know, we have some ideal locations, the industries are playing in but a lot of those sources are all qualitative. Um, so we work very hard with HVS on kind of identifying some of those things, um, but kind of one of the you know, byproducts that we're looking at, and we'll, we'll um, probably take this hotel feasibility study back with us to uh, LEDAC here at their next meeting, but to kind of look at how in the future we can sort of close some of these quantitative gaps as well. So that's kind of something that kind of goes in, involved. But, um, this still remains a very high priority. It's, it shows up on the uh, council goals year after year. It's a, a big piece of our economic development strategy. And um, in the end, um, HVS did identify uh, several sites um, that um, appeared to be economically feasible for the attraction of a potential hotel location. The, um, the key area was along the waterfront, um, which plays in very well with our recently adopted lakefront uh, revitalization plan, but the principal site that was identified um, was the uh, Dutch Harbor uh, property owned by the city, um, just uh, north of the Natural High property. Um, but additionally, there was also, you know, some some items that we're going to have to consider moving forward. Uh, that site, in and of its own, is slightly smaller than what a traditional development site for a hotel would be. Um, so there's, you know, possibilities of that they could develop on that site, but ideally they would like to expand that site to be a little bit bigger, um, which would bring us into perhaps looking at some potential um, dealings with the natural high property that's um, owned currently by the city, uh, by the school district. And um, moving forward there, and we were very cognizant because that came up quite a bit in our lakefront plan, that that piece of property there at natural high is very important to the community and as a place of maintaining its open space. So we really looked at uh, different pieces and made sure that we weren't looking at a huge chunk of that, of that property. But then also there's the possibility, as you know, when we were going through the lakefront planning process, that we don't really have a funding mechanism in place for a lot of the improvements that we want to see along that waterfront. So there perhaps would be an opportunity here in working with a potential hotel developer if one can be identified, um, that there might be some leveraging of those assets to help them, you know, they would help us by uh, maybe perhaps doing some of the um, improvement features. Most notably, which comes to my mind, would be the one that scored the highest in that lakefront plan, which was the promenade. So the study is, um, it's good, 
but you know, there's there's some there's some mixed news in there, which is exactly what we wanted in an honest study. So, in working with HVS, where we're at right now is uh, they've currently uh, taken the uh, the draft study that you have in front of you this evening and uh, put together a uh, marketing piece that's currently being solicited uh, to uh, the specific sort of market area that was identified, which um, mid-scale hotel, um, they gave a couple examples, uh, Best Western quality and um, some of the different types that Wyndham offers, uh, probably at the uh, range of uh, 55 units or, um, or, or more. We feel um, that the qualitative data probably suggests that there's room for higher growth, but the quantitative data kind of sets that as a, so we're hopeful that if we can identify someone, we can demonstrate to them that there is greater need, you know, hooking them up with uh, uh, folks in the, uh, the wine industry who have demonstrated and told us over and over again that they need better quality lodging and more rooms in the area. So um, our last check-in with them, the solicitation is through the end of this month. Uh, they have got a few people who are interested and they're saying that they're going to submit proposals. Um, I think there were four or five at the last check, so <coughs> fingers crossed as we move forward here. It is, you know, this has been a, a really good study um, and uh, hopefully it's going to uh, pay off sooner rather than later. So if there's any questions, there's, there's quite a bit of information in there. So. So Kevin, on the um, Dutch Harbor, where it says roughly 2.25 acres, assuming lot line adjustment, what ex explain the, what that means? But currently, the um, the Dutch Harbor site is uh, 1.8 acres. So to get it I into their ideal range of somewhere between two and a two and a half acres, you'd be looking at a lot line adjustment that roughly would encompass um, where the existing uh, building is at Natural High. Yeah. So, in other words, the empty space that's still there would still be there, and yeah, there correct. wouldn't be any change. And, and that's what kind of what I was getting at. There it wouldn't be any open. compromising of the empty space. It's just if people were looking at it and go, "This is great empty space," but if we took the building down, it would be more empty space. So, actually, it would, it, this would be all taken care of. Okay, that's what I thought. And would that also include the parking lot for the structures, or would the parking lot be outside of that area? Yeah, that's that's the main issue with the with the space is mostly of it being the parking area. So that's where the two and a half acres come. So it would be in addition to two and a half. The two and a half is necessary to include the parking as well. You're trying to take away the empty space with parking. <laughs> <laughs> it's very similar to what our lakefront plan looks like, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, looking closely at those design features, it, it kind of shows you know potential hotel or I think a couple of drawings show a, a conference center or something mm -hmm. completely contained on the Dutch Harbor site. But in yeah. reality, you know, it's it's a big piece of property if you include the portions of it that are in the water. Right. But its actual land footprint is is in, is closer to that one point eight acres. Did you get to see the marketing material that they were? Yes. Using. Yes. I'd love to see it. Sure. I, I don't have a background, Marty. It looked good to me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see how they're so, promoting Lake Fort and the bluff. They, they pulled a lot of information. We, we gave them a lot of information um, from uh, the Visit Lake County site, from our chamber, from Main Street Association, from our own, from the Lakefront Plan, of yeah. course. Yeah. So they, they were very comprehensive and um, in what they wanted and we provided and so yeah, good. it looked pretty good. And we, we made comments, they, they met with us. You did. Comments on, yeah. So, so the, um, naturally I didn't read all oh, come on. 100 pages of this stuff, but um, I noticed that they had other sites other than the lakefront site that could or could not be considered. Did we get any kind of, because I would think like Todd Road where, you know, the hamburger places and stuff are, that would be a great place for one too. And if we wouldn't take up any of the view of the lake. Do we have any consensus that anybody would want to try to put something up there? Well, we made sure when we were putting together the marketing piece that it was very clear that um, we were open to a hotel site anywhere. Um, so, uh, and the study did cover, you know, that Todd Road site specifically and, um, and a couple other sites that weren't along the waterfront. But the economic data kind of showed that um, the viability of them, not, not just being along the waterfront, but just being closer into the downtown uh, region were, were more economically viable. But no, we were very clear that we were open to 
any and all proposals. Yeah, I, I would think somewhere like out on Todd Road, you would get you know people driving down the highway and they'd see the hotel and pull over and use it type thing. Yeah, we brought that up because I mean the the closest one that we had was sort of Ukiah, where they have a very similar model, and and this was one of their their tough love perspectives on us. They just said that the volume on 29 is not the same as 101. So they didn't see it as being as viable as, you know, kind of like a, a stop. Oh, wait, we're going to stop here for the night because we've kind of, this is this is as far as we're going for the day. Um, but that's not to say they said that they recognized that that Todd Road site um, also looked at the, um, uh, the Vista Point site. Uh, there were several sites along the highway that were identified. I was just going to comment. Staff gave them a, a lot of areas to look and, you know, and study to see if they were viable spots. So we did give them a lot of areas. And even though the, the most, like I said, the Dutch Harbor site rose to the top and the waterfront ones rose to the top, that did include the entire city. It wasn't just a waterfront study. Okay, because a lot of the designs I've seen for the revitalization didn't have any buildings in either one of the lots. I mean, I've seen some at the conference center. I've seen some, you know, people talked about all kinds of different things, water parks and stuff like that. But once we give up waterfront, we can't get it back. So we're more concerned about that. But whatever. I don't think it's a give up. I think it's a trade and uh, it's a trade up in, in a lot of ways because it's not like there's not a lot of open space there right now for a town our size. And so I'm not really feeling that the heat on that one. And the city owning the property gives us negotiating to make sure that that stays open to the public, still has access in front of that hotel, part of a promenade, so it would close off the public access to the lakefront. So being it's our property, we, we have better negotiating to make sure that that happens. And it's a new way to enjoy our lakefront. You can actually... Staycation. Yeah. Staycation. I always have two blocks. So. <laughs> That's what you do. Get away from your phone. All right. Let's open this up for public input. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. We'll bring it back to council. Well, I'll just say that uh, going through most of the report, which I guess George didn't feel necessary to do, um, I was extremely impressed with the, the detail and, and the minutia that they covered and how, the, I mean, I looked at that and I just kept shaking my head. I go, man, these guys have tried to shake in every tree and looked under yeah. every bush and considered so many things that I never even dreamed were even there. So I was very impressed with the quality of it. And I think the fact that it's honest is what we want because there's nothing worse than to have somebody come blowing in here and think everything's going to be wonderful and then they find out they go well this doesn't depict what I read about in the promotional piece and then we're right back where we started I think it's great that they gave the hard numbers and did what they could with what they had I was very impressed with it and I'm, I'm, I think it was money well spent and if we have five applicants for those yeah. I hope so <laughs> So the, the five applicants, are they all thinking about the lakefront property? Not necessarily. Okay. No. Yeah, I don't. I don't know specifically what areas they're. You know, but um, I know it could be anything. I'm just, I'm just a little concerned. That I know they did tailor their search on who they went after um, for folks that met, you know, the, the market criteria. And the waterfront is a component of that, but not a complete piece of that. So. Yeah, because you know, and I'm a. Sh since how he read it all and said that they did such a great job. I'm assuming they know that you know it has to be built to the 100 flood level. Oh, yeah. Yep. You know. <laughs> 94 pages. 94 pages. Anybody else? I don't think so. I'm open to a motion. I'm Madam Mayor, move to adopt a resolution accepting a hotel feasibility study prepared for the City of Lake Forest by HVS. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Our next item is to authorize the City Manager to enter into an agreement with Quincy Engineering for an amount not to exceed $125,000 for the completion of engineering design services for a water main loop line connecting the South Main Street <coughs> water main with parallel drive water main. Is this Kevin? Okay. No, they're throwing rocks at me tonight. So, Madam Mayor, Honorable Council Members, um, 
I have to apologize. It looks like somewhere in all of the things that have been going on, um, there has been an error made in the staff report. Um, if you looked at the Quincy co um, cost proposal, it was for $159,259.84. And for some reason, uh, I'm not quite sure why, I put the 125. So um, actually, David, how can... It just needs to be reflected in the motion. Okay. okay. No big deal, Doug. We so got what, this. Okay, okay. Okay, well, I'm feeling kind of stupid right now, to be perfectly honest. I don't know Doug, how in the world I did that, but... Uh, so... What's the amount, Doug? Can you repeat so the amount? So, the amount is, um, well, let's just round it off to 106, not to exceed $160,000. Okay, okay. Thank you. That was under Nick's suggestion. Thank you. He likes round numbers. So, <laughs> continuing on, <laughs> Council, um, this project has been ongoing and for those council members that have been here for a while they're very familiar with this with this project this has been uh, on our radar and, and on our we need to get this done task list since 2008 uh, the problem that we have is we have two dead-end water mains um, we have one on parallel and we have one on south main and what happens when you have a dead-end water main is that your uh, number one your circulation as you get towards the end of that line gets less and less and less. So what we call the refresh rate, in other words, the amount of fresh water that comes into that, that replaces the water that's in there, greatly decreases because it, it doesn't have a continuous flow. It gets stopped at the end. And so then whatever business, it depends on how many people are drawn off the end on how fast that refresh rate is. So, any good uh, water purveyor, they they want to have a loop system so that, that so that you don't have this stopped or uh, water that's that's basically coming to an end and then having to be used before it can be refreshed. So, uh, with that in mind, that's what started the ball rolling in 2008. Is you know we need to get this loop line put together here for the health of our system. Then came development, and we've added the college now on um, Parallel Drive, which this loop line will serve as Parallel Drive as well. Another issue that you have with dead-end lines is back to refresh rate if, for fire systems. If you have a dead-end line, your refresh rate is not nearly um, as fast as if you have a loop line because for the hydrant they're drawing out of, the water will actually come from two directions instead of just from one direction. So as we build out, particularly on the parallel drive area, um, that flow rate for fire suppression is getting to be a bigger and bigger issue. The third issue and one, the main thing that brought this up is a, being a very urgent item is the county is looking at rebuilding South Main Street from the city limits on out to by the transfer station. So they have a minimum of a five year no cut. So in other words, once they get their new road in there, it's a minimum of five years before anyone is gonna be allowed to go in and, and cut the asphalt to do anything. Um, and personally, if I owned a brand new street, uh, I would not be really excited about anybody cutting in on it in 10 years. So what we want to do is to get in before they begin their project, get the loop line project included or run concurrent with their construction project so that our line is all installed and ready to go before they ever put new pavement down so that we don't have to worry about then negotiating a, a no-cut policy or dealing with that. So um, we're asking the council to approve for the design and completion of that design of that loop line 
um, so that then we can start the process of getting it um, either concurrent or included in the county's project. And then I'm sure council has questions, so I will entertain those. Currently on the South Main situation, where does it dead end at? Uh, Linda Lane and the city limits. Okay, so what we're proposing is putting in uh, a line all the way down to the stoplight? Or yes. The stop so we're pu putting in our water main into county property is what you're saying? When, well, it will be in county right away when it comes back across underneath Highway 29 mm -hmm. and onto South Main Street, then we come into uh, county right of way at that time. But from Linda Lane to the to the stoplight, that will be within the city's right of way. Right. Okay. Any other questions for council? And did we uh, ask for this for local engineering people to take a look at this instead of somebody out of town? Go ahead, go ahead, Yeah, I can answer that or or actually there there's a very specific reason in the staff report it kind of lays out why quincy engineering was chosen uh quincy engineering is the engineering firm that did the design for the county for that um, new road project so they have all of the engineering data they have all of the information they have all of the utility locations they have this this cost would probably be four times as much if they didn't already have that data and the engineering firm had to go out and regain all of the data that's necessary to put this line in and so by being able to um, to negotiate with Quincy uh, we're getting all of the engineering done at a hugely reduced cost um, and so to answer your question George it, it, it's dollars and cents so the, the, I guess, another question as I'm thinking here, which is very odd, but um, <laughs> seeing how we're going to put in a water main in county property down South Main, the people who have business and stuff there, would they be using our water at that point? Or how's that, how's that going to how's that gonna work? <coughs> well, there would only be hookups if you're in the city. There would okay. be, this is completing our water master plan. So what, what year did we create the water master plan? 2008. 2008. Yes. 2008. Okay. And that, did that have environmental and... So, so what you're saying is, is like oh, uh, the new motorcycle Honda shop there, okay, that's out of the city. We'll be putting our line in front of their place. How do they get their water? Are they still going to get it from the county or are they going to get it from us? Well, the county doesn't have water there, so those There's properties are on well. Oh, okay. And if they want to annex into the city of Lakeport, which is also, you know, we have a pre-annexation agreement with the county. Mm -hmm. Once they annex in, then they'll have the opportunity to get that water. Okay, so I'm thinking of this five-year no-cut plan now. So if, let's say that we put in this water main, and for some reason we get to annex South Main, and they want water, will they be able to get the water because we have this no-cut plan? Well, hopefully we're going to be able to put it down in what they call PUE, which is a public utility easement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's our hope that it would be accessible uh, going through the back of the sidewalk versus going out and okay. cutting up our street. I see what you're saying. You, could, you might put in some steps type things so that businesses can not cut into the road type thing. We're hoping the main's close enough that we can actually just tap into the main with a hot tap. Uh, a lot of times it's not uncommon to have a water main run right underneath the sidewalk. And so um, our goal is to be able to have it to be reachable uh, without tearing up the street. Okay. I'm just trying to figure the plan down the road. And I'd have to look at it again, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the South Main Street Soda Bay Road widening project um, does include laterals, uh, you know, stubbed out to, to all the existing parcels that are there. The road project the does, road right? The road project does, correct. Yeah, and those funds are from Area Planning Commission. Correct. But the water, the water users down there can't tap into our, system. our water right. unless LAPCO gets permission, and that's normally done through annexation. Okay. 
And this is that long sphere of influence annexation um, agreement that we've been trying to reach. And that this is one of the benefits to all the people in South Maine that they will have good, great supply of water, which they're sorely deficient in right now. And they desperately need it, and you're not keeping it away for free. <laughs> well, I, I, just, I was just trying to figure out, you know, who's going to get the water, when they're going to get the water. And the thing is, with the fire hydrants, I like that idea, and I like the idea it's less maintenance with the loop thing and all that. It's just that, you know, I'm looking at if, you know, because the city's been trying to annex South Maine for a long time, and it could be a long time still, and, you know, what's going to happen with those people, and that's what I'm concerned with. Well, it's a very good question about the lats, George, and, and that definitely is something that's being looked at as we move forward with the um, engineer design is future um, uh, possibilities when we annex, um, hopefully, which is going to happen, uh, to be able to provide that service without tearing our road all up. Yeah, that's what I'm concerned yep. Yeah. Good thought. Are there any other questions from council? We'll open it up for public input. Okay. Taking it back to council. Uh, one thing that I noticed, uh, there was a thing in there about should we fund it with um, reserves or wait till the fiscal year, 2018-2019, if I'm not mistaken. The, yeah, well, this would be water fund, uh, not our general fund reserves. And um, I've also been talking to funding sources, USDA, water resources, um, and I'm looking at both of them for funding, and they said that um, we would probably be able to go back and fund this with one of their funding mechanisms in the future. If we get the project funded through them, then we might be able to incorporate the, if we wanted to include this in the funding, we could do that, or we just use it out of our water reserves. So. Um, but I don't have the funding lined up yet for the project itself, and so that, and we're working on it right now. So we're going to be looking at a couple of different applications to see what the best what would be the best for the city. Uh, and it's, this was all totally funded through the water project. This is uh, this is to upgrade our water system as it is today, whether we annex or not. That this would help our water system. Okay, so if we approve it tonight, then are we waiting to the 18-19 fiscal year, or are we trying to get the money sooner? We're, we want to go ahead and move forward with the engineering and have it ready um, because, the, because of timing and when we'll be working on the funding for the actual project uh, immediately after we get the approval to move forward with the engineering. We'll be, uh, applying for funding for project itself. So this would be this year. <coughs> um, the project would be, you know, it would take four, at least four months to get approval for a project. So I'm assuming we have enough in reserves in the water fund to not be short. Right. Yes. So what you're saying, Margaret, is, is that um, if and when we are approved for the USDA project that they would uh, um, for reimburse us for the 160000 for engineering as part of the overall project if we get that taken care of. Right? I believe so with USDA. I was actually talking to Water Resources and they said that they believe they could include that. And I, I'm pretty sure with USDA, but I, I did not pose that exact question to USDA, so um, I don't want to say for sure. But at any rate, it needs to be done. Yeah. Madam Mayor, if there's nothing else, I'd move to uh, authorize the city manager to enter into agreement with Quincy Engineering for an amount not to exceed $160,000 for the completion of engineering design services for a water main loop line connecting South Main Street water main with the parallel drive water main. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And then I think the final. I did read some of this. <laughs> we'll move on to city council communications. Margaret, um, I just wanted to comment on uh, the police department. Um, I know that um, Brad and his staff had many sleepless working 22, 24 hour shifts uh, looking for the 16 year old that was missing and uh, we got a better home safe and so I really appreciate uh, all the time and effort and, and success in, in finding her. So, mm -hmm. what's your attention? Thank you, Margaret. Okay. 
Anything else, Doug? Uh, no, that's enough. Thank you. Um, yeah, just really quickly, uh, we're planning to have a budget workshop meeting um, on May 29th at 5.30, at 5.30 p.m. Um, we'd like all of you to attend. Um, it'll be a special meeting, but we're, we're hoping to get the budget approved in early June instead of the end of June. So May 29th, right? May 29th, 5, 5.30 p.m. Budget workshop. And uh, just really quickly, um, a local high school senior senior project is taking place on Saturday at the high school. Um, I've been helping mentor her and put together a mud run event. Um, she has about 80 uh, applicants so far, and they expect <coughs> a couple hundred people to be there. I heard today that Marty Schilt is going to be the MC. So if anybody wants to get muddy or just come out and check it out, um, Saturday at 7 a.m. it starts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> that is super cool. It's it's to support local law, <clears throat> local law enforcement agencies. It's in memory of uh, Officer Rumsfeld who recently mm -hmm. passed away. Um, and I think the chief has a team of guys that are going to be there. The sheriff mm -hmm. office has a team of guys that are going to be there. So it should be fun. And we're running there in Homestead, so. Yeah. Any injuries at soft duty? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many in the team? Uh, four man team. Four man team. Don't Any cost us our pizza in the next quarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep preparing to do Rob said there goes our pizza. We, we had pizza for everybody because we had a whole quarter without any injuries. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rob said there goes our next pizza. <laughs> no, we're very proud of staff. That was, it was great. Paul, you haven't said anything tonight. I know. I'll say one thing. Okay. Um, I have decided on the date for the open house at the water treatment plant, and that's going to okay. be uh, May 30th, and time will be from 4 to 7. And I wanted to extend it out a little bit so we can get some good uh, advertising out for the community. So, May 30th. 4 to, four to 7, is that yeah. what you said? Okay. Great. And that's all I have. Thanks Thank for you. working on that water line. <laughs> Thank you. Um, nothing else. Kelly? Nothing to report. Kelly? No. Council Member Spur? Uh, no report. Council Member Parlet? Um, tomorrow is <clears throat> the much awaited uh, chamber fundraiser that uh, I'm doing with them. But the following week, um, we are having our first episode of um, 59 Minutes to a Better Business because nobody in business seems to have an hour to give for training and improving their sales and marketing skills. I've handed these things out um, to North Shore Business, to the uh, Robinson Rancheria. I contacted Bennett and uh, Melissa, the Fult and Melissa Fulton at the Chamber. So um, it should be interesting to see how many people show up. And I, I mean, there could be, you know, two people or there could be 50. So it's going to be interesting. I know a lot of people that remember them originally really enjoyed them, but I think it's something that's desperately needed. Um, to try and help educate people about what they may or may not know or think they know about marketing, sales, and all the different things in the intricacies. The other thing I wanted to point out is that um, the uh, Coastal Mountain Officials Association has uh, 10 baseball games on Tuesday, March 1st, of which um, we only have enough officials to do. May, May 1st. Yeah, I'm sorry, what did I say? In March. 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 Uh, yeah, May 1st. And so there's a good possibility that um, I'm doing a game at Clear Lake against Willits, and I'm going to do everything I can to provide my services to the student athletes so they can have their game, And I, but I may be late. And I will be up at Calpine that day earlier catering, so it'll have a very narrow window to change clothes. And I'll probably come here in my baseball uniform, so I just want to let you know. All right. What are you doing the rest of the day? <laughs> Of course, when you're absent, we talk about you and volunteer. I won't be absent that long. No. <laughs> I'll just wear my cleats right into the room. <laughs> uh, additionally, uh, people come to the counter at community development in the county, and I've started telling them about the chamber classes and how to, t you know, the, what you guys are doing to help our businesses grow. It, it's going to be it's going to be a wild ride for hmm. people that haven't been to one. It's yeah. pretty crazy. Council member. Whatever your last name is. Matina. Matina. <laughs> 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 
I know, I remember you laughing at me when I stared at you and couldn't think of your name now. Take it. <laughs> um, let's see, Clear Lake High School is putting on their production of The Wizard of Oz Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and a matinee on Sunday. I know the um, Good Witch a little bit, and she said that it's really good. Well, she doesn't really know, but <laughs> no, we should all go. Um, last week I was uh, I attended the league um, committee meetings, and um, there's a ton of great information. Um, but a couple things: there are over 70 uh, wildfire and disaster response bills that have been introduced. Just thought that was kind of overboard, but um, but they're paying attention, so so that's good. And then. Um, Let's see, the Joint Homeless Task Force finished their report. It was um, the League of California Cities and CSAC, um, California State Association of Counties, got together and did a full report on homelessness. California has 25% of the homeless in the nation, so um, that's a lot. And um, there wasn't a lot in the report as far as some people criticized it that there weren't a lot of um, reasons or you know causes. They didn't really go that direction. They looked more to the future of how do we handle it from here. And um, you can look at the report um, if you go to the Institute for Local Governments. They prepare the report. Um, and it gives some real clear tools of what counties and cities can do. And, um, and, and tools to make a plan, and then there's about six pages of funding sources, but there's also quite a few bills been introduced for homeless <coughs> and housing and different ideas for that. So probably the better prepared we are with some planning, then maybe we you know, can all work together. And definitely the emphasis is on working with the groups that are already helping the homeless, because there is a lot going on, and sometimes you don't even realize how much is going on until you, you know, all do that. And we, we have quite a bit of that going on in the county right now. So but the, the report is really interesting, so if you want to check that out. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it. Mayor Buchan? No report. Okay. And I'll just close with inviting people to the uh, Peg Channel Garden Party, which is on April 28th. Uh, PEG stands for Public Education and Government Channel. It'll be down at the Highland Senior Center in Clear Lake, and it goes pretty much all day, starting with breakfast burritos and closing us out in the afternoon. So welcome nice. everybody to join us. With that, we will go ahead and close the meeting. Thanks for coming.